The American Board of Conductors was a brainchild of half a dozen senior colorectal surgeons who at the time were called proctologists. They got together and made a petition to American Medical Association for us to be recognized as a specialty, much like in UK that they had the proctologic section of Royal Society of Medicine. The AMA had a council of medical specialties and essentially looked at this thing for almost two years. And then they finally gave an approval. And in fact, Dr. Hirschman from Detroit ended up with having certificate number one. And so it became a board and it was probably a decade, maybe a little bit less, before American Board of Surgery was incorporated. Now the importance of this is that it protected the domain of colorectal surgery. The board is the gatekeeper of our specialty. We get board members that set policies, board examiners that are <clears throat> mostly senior um, surgeons, and they get together once a year and they examine candidates all day. Now we have to watch out for the barbarians at the gate. And Dr. Nigro had warned me carefully about this. And on his last days in the board, when he had plans for me to take over, we would walk around and he would teach me what's going on. Who are the threats to our organization? Who is watching us? Who wants to take over? And he was very leery of American Board of Surgery. He said, general surgeons treat colorectal surgeons as proctologists, as second class citizens. Even though we had incorporated some years before they did, so he told me what we should do in 1983 is to separate the written and the oral exam and make sure that our candidates, when they sit for the exam, they're already board certified by general surgery. Now, when they get a certificate, they have two certificates. So they're doubly board certified. Brilliant idea. And, and nobody could then look down at a certificate and say, well, you know, you're a second class citizen. Well, many of us did have two certificates, but this was made to be mandatory. You could not take American Board of Colorectal Surgery exam to this date without having passed your American Board of Surgery. So I got a call from American Board of Surgery that, you know, you're, you're credentialing 50 people. So why don't you come and bring your office to 1516 John F. Kennedy Boulevard in Philadelphia? Followed always my father's dictum. It is okay not to know what to say, but you must know what not to say. So I didn't say anything offensive. I said, well... What are we going to do with the exam? We have to give a certificate. He said, no, we can give a certificate to the American Board of Surgery, give a certificate of specialization. I said, we can't do that. We preceded you. Now you want me to give this up in 1985? When I become the executive director, I can't do that. Then there was other offer. Why don't you come to the American College of Surgery? It's across the street. We'll give you so many rooms. And I said, so what's the catch? Well, why don't you move your office here? And again, the board was very small, and we didn't have a lot of money. And then I came up with the idea that the best thing to do is to charge people some nominal fee 
as a contribution. It's not dues, it's not 501c3, it's not tax deductible. But you send a check every year and it's a business expense and 95% of the diplomats responded. And as things changed, the exam changed, the recertification came, we needed a bigger office, and so the idea was, well, Abkarian, you're in Chicago, why don't you move the office to Chicago? Nigro was in Detroit, the office was in Detroit. I said, we can't afford it. The same office space is gonna cost four times more in Chicago, plus I'm gonna lose all the people so the, the office stayed in Taylor, Michigan. The American Board of Colorectal Surgery got a handsome, I should say, recognition from American Board of Surgery. They wanted to know if we wanted to send a representative to sit on their board of directors, which is a big deal. And we said, we would love to do it, but would you reciprocate? Would you send somebody to sit on our board? So they said yes. So we sent Dr. Weidenheimer to American Board of Surgery, and they sent us Dr. Dekos from uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering. And we said we would like to have them for 10 years, but if it's a shorter term, that's fine. You call the shot, we would take it. And Mike Zinner came after that, the president, a chief of surgery at Harvard. And then we have had successional people and it, that tradition continues. The most we asked for, which you cannot compensate, is time. That is the biggest commodity. It's so much easier to write a check, but give me 20 hours of your time. See how hard that is. I left the board in 1986. They voted me to become their president for one year after. And uh, I did a few years of their examinations. Then I said, okay, time for some young people to come in. Dr. Weidenheimer many years ago gave a presidential address for society. It was called, Who Dug Your Well? And all of these wonderful guys in that picture with the champagne bottle. They started this. And did they know that it would succeed? Of course not. But they were committed. The importance of history is that we rejuvenate to find out who did all the work that we benefited from. And why is it so important that we defend the specialty, we are proud of the specialty, and, and we believe that we are, we are special. We are special. And so I tell the residents, please remember, American Board of Colorectal Surgery is a primary board we preceded American Board of Surgery. So don't call yourself a fellow. A fellow is a secondary board. You are not a fellow. You're a resident. Memory fades. And, and so it's just like our specialty. If me, in my age, and my successors, we have one year. If they don't carry the flag, it will be all forgotten one of these days. And if it becomes forgotten, we'll be superfluous. We might as well go to Philadelphia, become a subsidiary of American Board of Surgery, but we can't. We just have to preach our young kids, that be proud of what you, because this isn't, this wasn't accidental. A lot of work went into it. A lot of well was dug 
before we hit the water. Dr. Fancer was the first, quote, proctologist here in the state of Minnesota. He had a practice in Minneapolis, and he had a uh, preceptorship where people could come and study under him. If you go into the history of the American Proctologic Society, which really was formed in 1900 or 1899, in 1949, they were able to form the American Board of Proctology as an independent board. I think there were 18 independent boards that were established at that time, and that was the beginning. And actually, Dr. Frickman and Dr. Bernstein, who both preceptored under Dr. Fansler, were both certified after their preceptorship with Dr. Fansler. They were certified as proctologists in 1949, when the American Board of Proctology became an independent board. During my training, the American Board of Proctology changed its name to the American Board of Colon Rectal Surgery and changed the requirements, not just one year of general surgery and two years of a, of a preceptorship, but changed it to three years of general surgery and two years of a, of a um, preceptorship. When Dr. Wangenstein became the chairman of the Department of Surgery at the University of Minnesota, he asked Dr. Fansler to become the head of proctology in the Department of Surgery at the University of Minnesota. Fansler rarely got involved at the University of Minnesota. He always sent one of his preceptees, and that's where Dr. Bernstein got involved with Dr. Wangenstein at the University of Minnesota. When I finished med school, I took a rotating internship at the I, what, what then was the Minneapolis General Hospital. So then, following my internship, I took one year of general surgery in anticipation of, of applying for an orthopedic residency. However, this is when everything changed. Uh, I rotated onto the rectal service, or the proctology service, and uh, Dr. Bernstein, who was the head of the, of the proctology section, offered me a fellowship. I went over and I decided to make an appointment with Dr. Wangenstein, the head of the uh, Department of Surgery. He told me not to, he told me to stay in general surgery. So two years later, after th my third year of general surgery, uh, Dr. Bernstein came to me a second time and said, I'm running out of money for the training program in proctology, which had now changed its name to colonorectal surgery. And he said, uh, do you want to take the fellowship? And so I went over and chatted with Dr. Wangenstein a second time. And this time, Dr. Wangenstein looked me in the eye and he said, I think you ought to take the two years with Dr. Bernstein in, in colon rectal surgery. And when you finish, I want you to come back here and be chief resident in general surgery at the university. So I said, OK. <laughs> that was a marvelous offer. And so I took the two-year fellowship. And during that two-year fellowship, I was able to operate with Dr. Fansler, with Dr. Frickman, with Dr. Bernstein. All of a sudden, one day, uh, I was called to Dr. Wangenstein's office, and uh, Dr. Wangenstein looked me in the eye and he said, I understand that you uh, want to study at St. Mark's Hospital in London. I went to Dr. Wangenstein's office and he, uh, he arranged for me to uh, study at St. Mark's Hospital. Uh, and so I came home and told my wife that, well, guess what, we're going to London. The time at St. Mark's was, uh, I was able to operate with some fabulous people, Sir Lynn Lockhart Mummery and Sir Naughton Morgan and <clears throat> all these uh, famous people. And I came back and uh, by this time uh, I, I then went on to the university and finished my general surgical training at the university and took both boards. The, boards in colorectal surgery and the boards in general surgery, and uh, then proceeded to join Dr. Howard Frickman, who invited me to join him in practice. So Bernstein became the head of proctology. Fansler retired. At that point in time, nationally, it was all preceptor training. As a matter of fact, when Bernstein came to Dr. Wangenstein, he said, we ought to have an official training program here at the University of Minnesota. And Wangenstein looked 
Bernstein in the eye, says, how are you going to fund it? And Bernstein had just operated on Mr. Paper of the Paper Calmanson Company in St. Paul. And, and, and he went to Mr. Paper and he said, will you donate some money to the university so we can have a training program? He did. And so the program became an official program of the Department of Surgery at the University of Minnesota at that time. Bernstein um, then came out to the Veterans Hospital and took the section of proctology at the Veterans Hospital and included it into the training program uh, for proctology at the University of Minnesota. And that's where I got involved. I spent six years with Dr. Frickman and then, uh, unfortunately, Dr. Frickman developed a hypernephroma and died of uh, the hypernephroma. And at that moment, I was really devastated. I didn't know what, which way to go. And then, <clears throat> fortunately, Dr. Jerry Schottler, who had trained at the Mayo Clinic, joined us, uh, joined me. And then I was also able to hire Dr. Emmanuel Balcos, Manny Balcos, uh, who trained in colorectal surgery at the University of Minnesota and we got started and we and we formed colon rectal surgery associates and um, Dr. Bernstein had come to me and said he had run out of money uh, before Dr. Frickman died and we agreed to fund the training program at the University of Minnesota. There was a course that was started by Dr. Fansler and it was a course in proctology it was one of the few courses in the United States that covered anal rectal surgery and colon surgery. It was a five-day course run by Dr. Bernstein and Dr. Fansler and Dr. Frickman and Dr. Bowie from the, from the Mayo Clinic used to come up and lecture and Dr. Jackman from the Mayo Clinic came up and lectured. And it was lectures and there were wet clinics. By wet clinics, you actually took the registrants and brought them in the operating room with you. So I had to line up five patients on Tuesday, five patients on Thursday, and we would bring the applicants right into the operating room with us. I recognized immediately that there was nothing like a St. Mark's Hospital here in the United States. You had large clinics like the Cleveland Clinic and the Leahy Clinic and the Oxnard Clinic and the like. Uh, there really weren't any, any programs to speak of. I remember when I went on the American Board of Colon Rectal Surgery and I gave my first examination. <clears throat> I can tell you exactly where I was sitting on the airplane coming home. And I took out my little yellow pad and I said to myself, you know, we just certified six colorectal surgeons for a population of 220 million. And that's crazy. We're going nowhere. So the only thing that was going to do it was to establish more training programs and I felt strongly that they should be affiliated with university training programs in, in surgery. There are now 60 some training programs in colorectal surgery in the United States and Canada for a population of about 325 or 30 million people uh, that train about 100 colorectal surgeons per year. It is one of the most popular specialties in general surgery today and one of the more difficult fellowships to obtain today. In the old days it was pediatric surgery and cardiac surgery that were difficult to uh, get into those programs but today getting into colorectal surgery is not all that simple. I was born in 1941 in a small town 35 miles south of Atlanta, Georgia. I lived in a four-room house that had uh, a cold water faucet in the kitchen sink, but no indoor bathroom. My father and grandmother worked in the mills. My mother was a housewife. When I was a little girl, uh, I apparently ran around all the time. and. So I had fallen and cut my eyelid, and uh, on the way home from having the sutures removed, I s supposedly told my father and mother that uh, that was a nice man. 
when I grow up, I'm going to be a doctor too. My father died when I was six years old. Losing my father that young changed the world because had I stayed in Georgia, I guarantee you, we would not be sitting here talking. <laughs> my mother was intent on becoming a nurse. So we moved to a couple of places in Tennessee and then we moved to Maryland. In high school, I was introduced to uh, Seba's clinical symposia that were illustrated by Frank Netter. And that's where I became fascinated with anatomy. I did high school in Maryland and went to the University of Maryland in College Park uh, for my BS degree. The reason that I, that I picked a zoology as a major uh, was because that was biology. I mean, that was life. That was things that were, were living and, and I wanted to know more about them. Uh, actually got to begin dissecting things. My mother was pursuing her goals in nursing and uh, moved uh, to Chicago to be uh, director of nurses at Cook County Hospital. And that was my door into the University of Illinois at Chicago College of Medicine. And it was, it was like the first steps into this wonderful world that I had been looking forward to for as long as I could remember. The University of Illinois College of Medicine was actually ahead of its time because they had for some years allotted 20% of their freshman class positions to women. In my senior year, you know, you had, you had to have an uh, interview by one of the deans or associate deans. This fellow asked me, what, did I, you know, where, what was I going to do? And I said, I was going to be a surgeon. And he spent the rest of the time vigorously discouraging me from going into surgery and made it very clear that in his vaunted knowledge uh, that women didn't belong in surgery. So I politely said, thank you very much, left his office, walked across the street, and signed up for surgery at Cook County Hospital. <laughs> when I was a senior medical student at the University of Illinois. I was assigned to the uh, ob gyn service. They had performed um, <clears throat> a Wertheim procedure, major ob gyn procedure, on a lady who developed stress bleeding from her stomach. And I was the medical student on the EWAL tube trying to empty her stomach of the blood. And it was obvious that she needed something more than that. Dr. Jonason was a senior surgical resident at that time at the University Hospital. And she was called in. The place was in disarray because of what was happening. She walked in within a, a very short period of time. Things were organized, and it was clear that the woman was trying to bleed to death. And so within, I would think, a half hour, 45 minutes at the most, Dr. Jonason had everything organized and the woman was in the operating room and getting her life saved. And so I followed the patient to the OR. And I remember standing there and watching Olga Jonason operate and saying to myself, if she can do it, I can do it. That was like the final cement that made it absolutely clear without any question that I was doing what I was supposed to do. When I started my clinical rotations, I went through the usual, you know, medicine, internal medicine, psychiatry, pediatric, etc. I went through all of those and, and that just wasn't it. I just wasn't, I mean, it was okay, but it wasn't it. And then I rotated on surgery at Cook County Hospital. And I remember that when I walked on that surgical ward, it felt like I had come home. It really felt like I had come home. I applied for and got a straight surgery internship and then a general surgery residency at the county. Uh, and there had been 
25 years earlier, a woman who went through the general surgery program, and that was the, the last one until I showed up. Doing my, my, my training at, at Cook County Hospital was the best possible preparation for being a surgeon. It was a 2,500 bed hospital, busy all the time, um, and you got exposed to a, such a variety of illnesses and diseases and problems that when you got finished with that training program, you could handle anything. You might not know right away what to do with it, but you could figure it out because you had done so much of everything. And then I rotated on the colon rectal surgery service at County. The service had been established by Duran Smith, who was a proctologist on staff at Northwestern Hospital in Chicago. He was a superb technician, a magnificent teacher. I mean, he really knew the anatomy, uh, and he was a delight. Dr. Smith would come once a week, I think it was Tuesday afternoons, and so we would save up cases for him. And you know, he would come and then he'd have a little didactic session and then we'd go to the OR. And that was my introduction to colon rectal surgery. And, and I, with some trepidation, uh, asked him if I could become a fellow. And he said yes. <laughs> and so that was my, my uh, introduction to the field and to the training program and uh, uh, also to uh, Dr. Epkarian because he was the program director then. She spoke with Dr. Smith that she should come into colorectal surgery. She liked it. <clears throat> and he said it would be a good thing to do because the only other colorectal surgeon was a lady that lived in one of the San Francisco suburbs. So he said, come after Harry. I certainly worked as hard as the guys, sometimes harder, and never allowed there to be room to criticize me because, well, she's a woman and she didn't do that. That didn't happen. The colon rectal boards were given that year at the Oxner Clinic in New Orleans. The fellow examinees were around the lobby uh, testing each other and being nervous and crazy about it and all that. I went upstairs, went to bed, got up the next morning, I had Dr. Goldberg, I had Dr. Nigro, I had two, you know, two or three other oral examiners. I gotta be honest with you, I, the half hour that I had, I could not stump her. She knew everything cold. It was, it was just fantastic to uh, uh, realize how smart she was, how well-educated she was. She was a star. There was a meeting, and it must have been the College of Surgeons meeting in Chicago, and, and there had been a, a session going on in McCormick Place. And so I was coming from the garage into the main part of the building. Coming out the door to his car was Dr. Norman Nigro. And he greeted me warmly, and then he said, I shouldn't tell you this, but you passed your boards. Well, my goodness, I think I raised up off the ground 10 feet and didn't land until sometime the next day. When I found out that I was the, the first woman to be board certified, um, it was kind of a shock. I had never thought about it before. I had never considered the question. In retrospect, looking back uh, at having been the first woman to be board certified, I am humbled and honored, and I kind of like it. <laughs> I had been a senior examiner for uh, quite a few years, and during the process of doing that and being on the exam committee, uh, I would be asked to, uh, during the exam time, go room to room and watch uh, the examiners, and I would grade the examiners. And I started noticing that there were great variances between the difficulty of the exam being given in one room versus another room. And for those of you who never uh, had to take the exam during that period of time, what happened was that the, the booklets for the examiners had very short vignettes. And it might say, um, 
A young patient comes in, 25-year-old male, he's having bleeding, you get scoped and you find an adenomatous polyp. What do you do? Well, from there, they can go any direction they want. Someone could ask simple questions or someone could say, well, tell me about uh, polyp syndromes and then what's the genetic makeup of this? And you would find great disparities. And I thought, that's not quite fair. And uh, I commented at the exam committee meetings and I'd say, look, I'm worried about this. I was pretty vocal about it. As, as others, I wasn't the first one to discover this. After a matter of time, I was elected to the board. And when I came onto the board, Dr. Jim Fleshman, he was president of the board at that time. And he, he said, congratulations, you know that you, you've been elected to the board, but we're gonna give you this job to do. We want you to take care of it. We want you to rewrite the examination and uh, repair the problems that you perceive with it. So I said, Jim, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be honored to do that. I said, I just need one, pe one guarantee from you. And he goes, what's that? And I said, you know, I, I know somebody I'd like to have help me with that. And can I use that person to do this process? He goes, absolutely, you can do that. I said, good, I pick you. And he goes, you should have been a lawyer. That's unbelievable. <laughs> so he and I became uh, partners in, in rewriting uh, the exam. He had unfortunately been admitted to the hospital at Wash U and I uh, heard, heard about it. And I called his wife and said, look, as soon as I get off work today, I'm gonna get on a plane, I'll surprise him. I'll fly up and come see him in the hospital. Long story short, when I, when I came to his room, I'm talking to him on my cell phone and I opened the door. He's standing at the window looking out, talking to me on the cell phone. Now we're both still talking on the cell phones. I said, Jim, we don't need to talk on the cell phone anymore, I'm here. And so he put his phone down and kind of laughed about it. And he, he said, well, I'm going home tomorrow. And I said, well, good. I'll come by, come by the house, you me to stay at the house and we'll just uh, maybe watch some ball games if you want, I'll do, you take it easy. He goes, no. Let's get on it. Let's just do the test. Let's work on the test. So we went home and we worked at his house. His, his problem was you know, taken care of, but we, we had to uh, get up early and we cranked all through the day to get, to get the test done. So on this new exam, we figured whether you had to go stepwise down through an algorithm to get to the finished, finish point. And that was not difficult. So if you picked uh, the subject was going to be rectal cancer, or whatever, you can work up, you know, the workup, the diagnosis, the treatment, post-operative care was, was pretty much straight. But then you realized the problem arose is that different people could have different answers to the problem you presented them. And the answer could be not the best answer, but an acceptable answer. So what happened was that became the real problem, writing enough uh, answers that could be utilized, but they weren't the perfect answer, but they certainly had to be counted. When we had the written exam, we have somebody, uh, the board would have this statistician come in and review the questions and the answers and find out, is it a statistically fair exam, the written exam? So somebody had suggested that we do that with the oral exam to make sure that it was statistically appropriate. He said, you guys have had a 14% fail rate for four years in a row with the test. And he goes, you can't, you just can't do any better. There's nothing I could do to fix that. So we were very, very happy with the outcome. Uh, shortly after that, we got a letter from the American board. They thought our, our exam was a, a good change of pace and all, and that would be okay if you know they kind of went down that road themselves. And uh, I was more than pleased that they wanted to kind of uh, borrow from our experience. And there's nothing more important than certifying people by the exam and uh, I just found that to be the high point for me to be involved with that. You want people that are being certified to be of the quality that you'd want to take care of your own family. I've been fortunate enough to be in leadership positions on two different occasions where I got to vote about uh, the next editor for the journal. And there were two great candidates that came about and uh, we discussed it for a whole afternoon, reviewed all their data and all. And as it came out that Dr. Fazio was the most qualified and uh, he took over the role and, and did a great job of advancing the journal. When I became president of the society, uh, it came up again that we're gonna need to have a new uh, editor of the journal. I really did my homework on the front end to make a pristine committee, which did not include me, a pristine committee of people who were well accepted and knowledgeable researchers, writers, contributors, peer reviewers for other journals. 
And uh, when it was over, uh, they came back and the nominee was that was selected was Dr. Susan Glandiak, who's head of colorectal surgery at the University of Louisville. And I would say that since she's taken over the journal, there are so many changes that she's made that are so significant that it's bringing the journal into the modern age. Now you can get it in, in, in Spanish. There's a Chinese translation available. There are audio videos that you can see. And she has monthly talks with uh, on, on the internet uh, with authors. So many things that, that she's put together in, in the uh, structure of the journal that makes it better and, and up to date. You know, it's a 10 page outline of things that she's accomplished and she's been a great, great uh, addition to the journal. Remember that the journal is important to our, to our society members because it has become the leading source of uh, research information written in the world for colorectal disease. Hispanic nations look to it, Europeans, Chinese, Japanese people look to it because it's, it's the uh, original and now the most updated uh, journal for that information. Great abstracts, great articles that have been peer reviewed with a good statistical analysis, comments in the, in the journal, uh, special uh, editorials. Uh, it's just the complete uh, uh, panorama of what you need uh, for educational purposes uh, where you can get it about your specialty, your interests, all in one place. So we noticed that there were a lot of young, young members of the society, smart, who wanted to do research, but they couldn't get the money to get started. Uh, up to that time, to get research money, you either had to get it from your institution if you were at a medical school or at Auctioner or Cleveland Clinic. So once the foundation started having, research foundation started having fund, fundraising drives and things, people gave money to it, it built up, it built up, it built up. At this point now that you can apply, even if you have a simple little research project that you'd like to try, you can apply for money there and they can give you enough funding to help you get going. And uh, you, you see now, Decades later, some of the people who took advantage of that as, as rookies when they were coming into the society now are funding their own research through institution and nationally because they got started. Because you have to get started, you have to lay down a track record that you've done four or five papers before somebody else will uh, fund a big study for you. You look at our society and it offers uh, all the education which we talked about a little bit before, but we have a national meeting, we have a journal, we have a research foundation, all these arms and tentacles that come out of the society that all help with making better doctors. And that's what we're looking for, better surgeons to take care of our patients, because that's the ultimate goal that we give the optimal care that we can. Years ago, uh, I was asked to go to uh, the elementary school where my son was going and they had when dads were invited to come talk about what they did. So I brought some masks and hats and I brought a little flex sig scope and a box and I put a ninja turtle inside there and they were able to scope and see what it was and and uh, it was a good experience for me and hopefully for them and I got letters. The teacher made them all write me a letter, a little short paragraph. And when I received those letters, one of the uh, letters kind of struck me. And uh, his, his, I think his name was Ian Kennedy. And um, he had written that, Dr. Hicks, thank you so much for coming and spending your time teaching us about being a surgeon and a doctor. Your job must be the greatest job in the world. And I realized that I could add a quote from any number of famous surgeons historically and all, but nobody put it together better than a fifth grader. You have the best job in the world. <laughs>